everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to get started now. We have Dr. Moore here today, so I'll turn it over to him for some brief remarks. Good afternoon. Bon après-midi à tous. I want to thank all Ontarians for the incredible sacrifices you've made over the last several weeks. They are having an impact. Our healthcare indicators suggest a general improvement in the COVID-19 situation in the province, with the number of hospitalization and cases in the intensive care unit continuing to increase, but at a slower pace than we've seen in the previous weeks. In this past week, our average percent positivity of tests is 18.41% compared to the previous week when it was 22%. Based on the current stabilization in Ontario's testing strategy, this is likely reflective of a real decline. Because of your extraordinary efforts to help blunt the transmission of Omicron and protect our health system capacity, we can gradually begin easing public health measures on Monday, January 31st, while still keeping up with the measures that are helping reduce transmission. Grâce à vos efforts extraordinaires pour atténuer la transmission de Omicron et protéger la capacité de notre système de santé, nous commencerons à assouplir les mesures de santé publique lundi le 31 janvier, tout en continuant à suivre les mesures qui contribuent à réduire la transmission. This means that on Monday, we in Ontario will increase social gathering limits to 10 people indoors and 25 people outdoors, allow 50% capacity for most indoor public settings, such as restaurants, casinos, cinemas, with proof of vaccination, allow 50% capacity or 500 people, whichever is less, for spectator capacity in sporting events, concert venues, and theaters, and the 50% capacity will also include religious services, rites, or ceremonies. While this is positive news, we must remain vigilant in the face of this virus, and our continued reopening efforts must be implemented cautiously. Vaccination. And in the face of Omicron threat, we are fortunate that our vaccination rollout continues to be strong. 91.7% of Ontarians aged 12 and over have received one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and 89.1% are fully immunized. And this is a tremendous achievement. The efforts we are making to get shots in arms will help protect Ontarians against severe outcomes of COVID-19, including hospitalization and admission to the intensive care units. Les efforts que nous déployons pour administrer les vaccins aideront à protéger la population ontarienne des répercussions graves de la COVID-19, y compris l'hospitalisation et l'admission aux soins intensifs. Data from Public Health Ontario demonstrates that Ontario rates of hospitalization are higher amongst unvaccinated individuals compared to those of, who have completed the primary vaccine series. This trend has remained consistent over time and is across all age groups. And adults 60 years of age and older benefit from being fully vaccinated as two doses means they have 12 times reduced risk for hospitalization compared to being unvaccinated. But when they get their booster, they are now 22 times less likely to be hospitalized. So two is good, but three is proving to be much better. So thank you to the over 6.2 million Ontarians vaccinated with three doses. This accounts for more than 51% of our adult population age 18 and over. And I would especially like to thank Ontarians who have come forward to get immunized since we started the modified stage two in, on January 5th. In the last three weeks alone, we have administered over 2.4 million doses, 161,000 first doses, 178 second doses, and over 2.1 million third doses. And with respect to the third doses, I want to acknowledge over 996,000 Ontarians 50 and over have come forward for their booster. This is incredibly important as booster doses have been shown to reduce the, or the risk of severe outcomes of Omicron, such as hospitalization and death, by around 90%. They have also been shown to be 60% protective against symptomatic disease. Because of you, 61.9% of Ontarians 50 to 69 and over 80% of our 70 plus population are now protected with three doses. We also saw the first dose protection for our youngest eligible Ontarians increase in the last three weeks 
from 44.6% to 52.7%. And 13.2% of our 15 to uh, five to 11 year olds are now fully vaccinated with two doses. While these numbers represent a great achievement in under three months, Ontario's total vaccination coverage for this age group can be improved. While children are typically at lower risk of hospitalization from COVID-19, severe outcomes can still occur, particularly, particularly in children who have other medical conditions. Vaccination has been shown to significantly decrease the risk of severe outcomes, including for children eligible for the vaccine. The pediatric Pfizer vaccine has been shown to be safe, effective, and provide strong protection against COVID-19 and its variants. Vaccination also helps protect other individuals, including children under five who cannot yet receive a vaccine. In fact, a large number of hospitalization in children under 18 years of age are currently in that population under five who have not yet had an opportunity to be vaccinated. So we need to see increased uptake in eligible children and in families. We need to make sure that those who live and care for children too, too young to be vaccinated, are vaccinated and boosted. Il faut donc que la prise de vaccin augmente chez les enfants admissibles et nous devons aussi nous assurer que les personnes qui vivent et prennent soin d'enfants trop jeunes pour être vaccinés aient reçu leur vaccin et leur dose de rappel. Though vaccination remains key, we do now have oral outpatient antiviral medication to protect the province's most vulnerable. Ontario has received limited quantities of Paxlovid, and we are prioritizing unvaccinated individuals who are most at risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19 infection. L'Ontario a reçu des quantités restreintes de Paxlovid et la pri priorité est donné aux personnes non vaccinées qui courent les plus grands risques de répercussions graves d'une infection de COVID-19. These individuals include unvaccinated seniors aged 60 and over, First Nations, Inuit, Métis individuals aged 50 and over, and individuals aged 50 and over with underlying risk factors. We will also prioritize immunocompromised individuals 18 and over, regardless of their vaccine status. Paxlovid is for people who have mild symptoms, who test positive, and must be taken within, and the medication must be taken within five days of experienced symptoms for it to be effective. And the early data on antivirals is promising. They have been shown to reduce the risk of hospitalization by 88%. But Paxlovid is not a replacement for vaccination. We strongly encourage you to get fully vaccinated against COVID-19 as soon as possible to protect yourself, your loved ones, and our communities from COVID-19. I also wanted to take a moment to address Directive 2 in recognition of the impact it, it, uh, it has had on Ontarians awaiting care and with careful monitoring of hospital capacity. We intend to take a phased approach to resuming some health services that were paused when the directive was put in place. This initial phase will roll out for the resumption of some previously paused activities as early as next week. Careful resumption of this activity in targeted areas is likely to adversely impact inpatient capacity readiness or human health resources in hospitals is least likely to reverse the impact. This does not mean all hospitals will immediately resume the surgical and procedural activities permitted. And we are working with Ontario Health and the sector on this first step with additional details to be provided in the coming days. Once again, I wanna thank Ontarians for the sacrifices you have made, not only in these past weeks, but over the last two years. Encore une fois, je remercie les Ontariens et les Ontariennes des sacrifices qu'ils ont faits, non seulement au cours des quelques dernières semaines, mais au cours des deux dernières années. January 25th marked the two-year anniversary of the first case of COVID-19 identified in Ontario and in Canada. These last 24 months have been difficult and stressful for too many families marked by tragedy and loss. 
All of this can take a toll on our mental health and well-being. And while Bell's Let's Talk Day may have been yesterday, may, may have been yesterday, let's keep the conversation going every day. Check in on your neighbors, your friends, and your family. And if you need help, do not hesitate to reach out and ask for it, whether it is for loved ones or from one of the many mental health resources in the province. Practicing self-care and staying connected has never been more important. Thank you, Nefsi. Go to the phone lines for questions. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. Your first question comes from Allison Jones with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Moore. Um, I suspect you probably know what question I'm going to ask you first. It's one I've asked you a few other times uh, lately. Unfortunately, we are still seeing quite high numbers of deaths reported each day, and I'm wondering if now you've been able to um, look at the data and uh, tell us what's going on, what is behind these high numbers. So um, what we've done is uh, I've sent a, a memo out to all healthcare providers uh, across Ontario that fill out death certificates. Uh, so that's nurses of extended class and all physicians to ensure that they're aware of their obligations to report to their local public health agency if a person that they're caring for has died as a direct result of, the, of uh, reportable disease, and that would include COVID-19. So that's a reminder that this data is extremely important. It's important for us to count and track this and to be transparent to all Ontarians. We've also um, reminded them of how to fill out the death certificate following the World Health Organization's instructions on how to document uh, the death if it's caused by or associated with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so prospectively, we're gonna be monitoring the quality of that data as it comes uh, to public health, as well as to the registrar. Uh, as well, we've connected with the coroner's office uh, and want to have uh, ongoing education of physicians and nurses on the importance of this data. We're going to do a selective uh, review of uh, death certificates uh, and deaths documented in our case and contact management in partnership with local public health to ascertain uh, the quality of the data, how well it's being documented. Um, uh, and we're gonna be looking at all cause mortality to understand if we're missing uh, deaths that could be associated with COVID-19. So uh, thank you for your ongoing questions regarding this. It's uh, very important that we have good data for all Ontarians to understand the impact of COVID-19. Uh, it won't be changed in a day. Uh, uh, it's gonna be a journey to improve that level of data, but we're committed to it. Um, both through our public health partners, our uh, hospital partners, as well as our coroner system, uh, and those that fill out death certificates uh, in the community and hospital sector. Um, at present, though, we're confident that the, uh, the deaths are being documented as probably a combination of causative and associated deaths within our systems. Uh, in our retrospective review, I think will give us better assurance uh, on the level of quality. So uh, I would thank you for the question. It, it, we're working on this, uh, but I, I don't have an immediate answer given that this is gonna be a journey of improving a very important data uh, element uh, in, in our uh, uh, suite of information that I think is important and relevant to Ontarians. So, uh, in the, uh, we addressed hospitalization and now have good information on uh, causative admissions versus uh, associated admissions, both to the general hospital wards as well as to the intensive care unit. And we're committed to providing that same level of uh, improved data for death certificates. Follow up. Is, is that the largest outstanding question with the death data though, whether people are dying uh, because of COVID or with COVID, you had said, I think last week that it seemed like a large number of the deaths were still uh, due to Delta um, because of, I guess, the lagging time of infection. Do you still see that is the case? Have you been able to, to see the data on that to see whether it's just the volumes of Omicron that's causing these high numbers or whether Delta is truly um, behind some of this? Well, a very interesting question again. So what we've learned through our Public Health Ontario partners who uh, know of the incidence of Delta versus Omicron, uh, they've told us that the vast majority of outbreaks in the community are absolutely Omicron, 99.9%. Um, but in hospitals, given the severity associated with Delta, 
um, that their whole genome sequencing is telling us around 10% of admissions in the hospital are still relevant to Delta. Uh, and the whole genome sequencing data takes weeks to get back. So we'd have to correlate that with the death certificate to ascertain um, whether it was Delta and or Omicron. Um, we absolutely agree that uh, a significant proportion of the deaths in January would have been because uh, de death is a delayed signal um, uh, from um, uh, an outbreak, uh, given that we've got uh, access to healthcare and an ability uh, to try to protect people through hospitalization and intensive care unit settings. Uh, that that um, in, in the first several weeks of January, we're confident that a significant proportion of them were from Delta, but now we need to tie them also with whole genome sequencing uh, data. Next question. Your next question comes from Matthew Bingley with Global News. Please go ahead. Hi, doctor. Uh, you, you pointed to the number of hospitalizations that are still on a rise, uh, uh, even though it is a slower one. Um, but in the directives today, we're seeing that contact tracing will no be longer be required for businesses next week. And I'm just wondering at a time where you're saying there is still a need for constant vigilance and uh, uh, protection. And when we see, uh, you know, uh, testing is still under, uh, uh, under a threat, uh, why you would be removing this from uh, the directives? Well, thank you, Matthew. Um, uh, our Key goal with public health right now is to protect the most vulnerable sectors. I, I think we can assume that uh, given uh, Omicron's transmissibility, it, it, there is an ongoing risk in, in our communities uh, uh, and we must individually try to reduce our risk over time by taking all the appropriate measures, getting vaccinated, wearing a mask, distancing, good hand hygiene, monitoring for symptoms, uh, and, and those will keep us well protected. Our public health agencies now are, are trying their best to work with our long-term care partners, those that are in shelters, uh, the, those high-risk congregate settings uh, where they're trying to uh, protect those patients and populations uh, through outbreak management and case and contact management in those high-risk settings. Um, the, the amount of virus in the community is not such that case individual, case and contact management uh, uh, will have any benefit. I think on an individual level, you have to identify your risks uh, you have to monitor your symptoms on a daily basis. If you've got symptoms of COVID-19, we've got instructions on Ontario.ca of how to monitor and care for yourself and when to seek health care and when to um, you know, get access to the RATs, which I'm happy to say we'll have uh, greater access in the coming weeks, uh, given that the federal government uh, is um, uh, starting to ship more and more uh, RATs to us so that you can have uh, testing done in the comfort of your apartment or home um, and not have to uh, go elsewhere for it. So um, I hope that uh, the Ontarians understand that we're trying to prioritize uh, uh, our case and contact management capacity for the highest risk and most vulnerable populations. Follow up. Global News has been reporting for two weeks on doctors spreading misinformation in Ontario, and now one has launched a service prescribing, or prescribing rather, ivermectin to treat the virus. Uh, the Ministry of Health has so far refused to uh, answer questions to us on this, and I'm wondering what concerns you have over, uh, you, you know, the, the or, or really what the point is of of license restrictions if there are loopholes such as this that can be exploited and what concerns you might have over a refusal to help the CPSO uh, as uh, help out the public with this increasing risk. Well, thank you for that question. So the science table uh, has a document on, on their website that outlines what therapies have good science to support them and what, uh, what don't. Uh, and on their recommended against list, uh, uh, where the following therapies are not recommended for the treatment of COVID-19 due to the lack of benefit, potential harm, and system implications for, of uh, system implications of overuse, they include uh, ivermectin in that list. They're, they're the experts on therapeutics and have done the research and science on them. Um, so uh, I would hope that the College of Physicians and Surgeons would recognize um, if, if a science body says uh, they should not be used, that that physician's practice would be reviewed uh, and an appropriate uh, review of their practice and discipline would be put in play. Uh, uh, it's a question perhaps best uh, for the, uh, the college themselves. 
Uh, but um, uh, the science table has confirmed that uh, ivermectin um, is not a medication that should be offered for the treatment of COVID-19 in Ontario. Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, doctor. Um, I just wanted to get at the uh, vaccine passport situation. You were saying earlier how important it is to get a booster, but they're, they're still not part of the vaccine passport system. So I'd, I'd like to get your thinking, please, on, on why they aren't in, and do you ever see boosters being part of the vaccine passport system? Well, thank you for that, Robert. Um, th that would be a government decision, and we would give them options uh, on how uh, to include a third dose uh, in, into the uh, passport system. Um, uh, uh, we have not reviewed that as an option for government a a as of yet uh, and are waiting uh, nationally to hear the direction of the federal government, uh, as well as uh, whether other uh, governments across Ontario or, or across Canada are moving in that direction. Um, uh, so, so it's a, a clearly an open policy uh, window at present. Follow up. All right, thank you. And um, uh, I, I noticed this week the YMCA uh, in the Toronto area put out a notice telling its members that when gyms resume uh, or reopen on Monday, the YMCA will require masking at all times, even when people are exercising. So what is your uh, recommendation on that? I don't think in the, in the document we got already, I, I, if there is something in there about people in gyms wearing masks at all times, I missed it. So what, what's your thinking on whether people should wear masks in a gym? I notice a lot of gyms, for example, between the cardio equipment have a plexi, plexiglass shield. And with this being an airborne virus, uh, you know, some people question how much good that actually does. Uh, well, that's a really good question. So any independent gym or business is able to put in additional measures as they see fit. Uh, we do see the benefit of multiple layers. So um, uh, uh, having uh, screening for any symptoms of COVID-19 before entry, uh, good hand hygiene, good distancing, good ventilation in, in the building itself, managing your filtration system, your HVAC system, all of those can help reduce uh, the risk, uh, the addition of masking uh, it is beneficial. Uh, uh, we've got plenty of science, I believe, now to support um, masking. Uh, I, although I can understand in certain elements of exercise, it may be difficult uh, to maintain masking, but uh, I, I would support a, a policy that includes a multi-layered approach uh, to protecting individuals um, uh, in that environment, including masking. Next question. Your next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan with City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Moore. Earlier, uh, in response to Matthew Bingley's question, you were suggesting that people need to monitor themselves. He was asking when it came to contact tracing being eliminated in restaurants, for example. I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at is your overall message that we all just have to monitor ourselves now and know that if we go to a restaurant or a sporting uh, event or a movie theater, that there is a, a strong possibility that it, it COVID is around us and that we just have to watch ourselves and take that risk. Uh, I, I think you're, you're wording it um, well. Uh, I, I think um, we have to uh, understand with Omicron that we uh, can't eliminate this threat, uh, that uh, in fact, we have to learn to live with it that we're trying to reduce our risk, but we cannot eliminate the risk in every uh, aspect of our lives. Uh, and we have to have a balanced approach as a society against this threat. Um, the ways we reduce the threats have worked well over the last two years of masking and distancing and hand hygiene and staying home if you're sick. Uh, as well, we now have the benefit of, of very good vaccines. Uh, uh, two is good, three is certainly better, uh, and encourage anyone to get their third dose who is eligible, 80 Four dose, 84 days after their last dose, but you're, you're absolutely right. We have to learn as a society to live with this virus, to live with the, the risk uh, wherever we're going in our community uh, and adhere to all the best practices. Uh, and uh, as a government, we're opening up in a very cautious and slow manner uh, to try to protect uh, um, uh, our communities as well and 
the health system. Uh, we've been uh, slow and steady and cautious in Ontario, and that has always done us well. Uh, and individuals should uh, have that same approach. Adhere to all the best practices, uh, do a risk assessment when you go out, uh, and ensure that you feel comfortable where you're going, uh, into what venue, uh, but it, ad adhere to all the best practices you can to reduce your personal risk and the risk of, of those around you. Follow up? Thank you. Thank you. So if you're going to a stadium, and I know it's capped at 500 or 50% capacity, uh, now snacks will be served and drinks. And we know from pre-holidays that a lot of people were enjoying a hockey game or wherever they were, um, and they weren't masked. So if you go to one of those situations, are you basically uh, really exposing yourself? And, and, you know, what happens if masks aren't being worn in these locations? What, what are the odds that you'll get it? Uh, so really good question, um, and I'm happy to provide a little clarity. You must be masked in all of these venues. Uh, uh, you'd be masked when you pick up your food, let's say at a cinema uh, or theater. Uh, and uh, once you sit down in your designated seat, that's when you can take off your mask uh, and uh, you know enjoy uh, the food that you've purchased. Uh, we don't want you walking around uh, without a mask uh, and, and uh, potentially having an increased risk. So uh, the compromise was that uh, you can eat or drink when seated, uh, but not to enable you to walk around unmasked. Uh, uh, and uh, the basic tenant of maintaining distancing um, uh, and masking when not eating is always maintained and screening before you go in uh, to an environment like that. So it, it is, again, uh, trying to have a balanced approach. We're reducing the risk. We're not, we can never eliminate the risk completely. Uh, and, and we all have to have a balanced approach to, uh, in these venues. Uh, we hope in, in theaters or if you're watching uh, an OHL game that you'll be distanced uh, and uh, that you'll enjoy the environment uh, and that we'll be ab able to increase the number of people in those environments over time. But we want to do it slowly, cautiously and safely. Given that Omicron is still quite active in our communities, well, it will be a difficult February, but it'll be a better March. Uh, and, and as we head into the spring, I, I do hope it'll be much less risk in our environments. But I ask everyone to continue to maintain all the precautions that they've uh, taken uh, and thank uh, the two million uh, Ontarians that have come forward to get vaccinated uh, since January 5th to the 26th. Um, uh, uh, they've all heard the call that we need to be, protect each other and ourselves. Uh, and the third dose it, it has a significant bump in protection against severe outcomes. I absolutely encourage everyone as your individual risk reduction vaccination and the third dose is absolutely key. Next question. Your next question comes from Brian Lilly with the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, you, you're talking a lot about uh, people needing to take their own risks, um, slowly reopening, but a lot of Ontarians might be looking around and saying we are moving a lot slower than other jurisdictions. And while you and the government, which are not the same, but you're both saying that you're following the science, uh, other jurisdictions such as Britain, Ireland, the Netherlands, Denmark are all reopening much quicker and they're saying they're following the science. Denmark will move to virtually no restrictions next week. So what is the difference in terms of the science that you're looking at and, and what they're looking at? Is it just a difference in, in how things are playing out in Ontario? Is it a different risk tolerance? What is the difference between what we're seeing in other jurisdictions in Europe and what we're seeing here? A uh, really good question, uh, and, and certainly we're focused on the Ontario situation. In Ontario, uh, for this particular wave, we've been really concentrating on protecting our health system, protecting the hardworking nurses, uh, physicians, respiratory techs, dietitians, administrators. Uh, uh, we know that they're 100% capacity uh, already, uh, and we don't want them to have to be at 110 or 115%. We want to be able to provide care to Ontarians at the right time, at the right place, if they need it, uh, and, and that has been our focus. Uh, health systems are unique to each uh, country and or province uh, and have certain limitations and capacity uh, uh, limits. Uh, and uh, our goal, and, and thank you Ontarians for all the sac sacrifices you've made since January 5th, has been simply to protect the healthcare system, not to eliminate the virus. 
Uh, and we think we have plateaued. We think we've reached a crest after which we hope there'll be a steady decline uh, and, and that um, the sacrifices that we've made have allowed uh, the health system to be able to provide the right care at the right time. Uh, I do believe we've achieved that. Uh, and now we can slowly and cautiously uh, remove uh, the public health measures so that we don't have a, a sudden rebound uh, and a, a negative untoward effect on our health system. So it's really dependent upon each individual health system. In Denmark, they put in a very profound public health measures long before we did, um, which were, I would say, in a severity index, much more severe and, and prolonged. We tried to time ours to be uh, as minimal as possible to be as balanced as possible and to protect uh, the health system as best we could. And I do think, thanks to all Ontarians, we've been able to achieve that. Uh, so, so great question. We're, we're monitoring what's going on in all of these other jurisdictions. We're monitoring uh, best practices, trying to understand uh, how we can minimize public health measures because uh, no one wants these in place for, uh, as the Premier would say, a minute longer than they have to be. Uh, and and um, uh, we're trying to assure that our goals that we set out uh, as a province um, uh, have have worked. I do believe uh, uh, they have. Uh, and now it's time to slowly reopen and, and avoid a rebound in cases and impact on the health system. Uh, I trust Ontarians that we can open safely uh, and cautiously. And if if we're making uh, quicker progress, uh, I rest assured that we'll continue to follow the data uh, and, and uh, remove public health measures uh, in a responsive means um, to, to have us back to as normal as we can be. Uh, it's a cautious plan, but it will always respond to data. Follow up. It, so I appreciate the answer, Doctor. And while I might find your plan too cautious, there are a number of people, including uh, doctors, who are saying that you are being far too aggressive in in moving forward, and that you're putting everything at risk. That we shouldn't have opened schools without more measures in place. That reopening businesses next week uh, it will put all of us at risk. That essentially we need to continue lockdowns. And so there's a lot of people who listen to these doctors who believe that, you know, don't believe what you're saying, that we need to in some ways learn to live with the virus. So how do you convince nervous Ontarians that this is not something that we're going to get to zero before we start moving back to normal life? What do you say to people who are anxious because they're listening to doctors who say any reopening is too much or too soon or puts us or our children at risk. Yeah, so a uh, great question. And it's uh, it, it, it's a discussion I think uh, in, in our democracy uh, we should have. Uh, and, and I do wa uh, want us to have a balanced proportioned and reasoned and data-driven reopening. Uh, and, and in the face of Omicron, I absolutely think we have to uh, start to, to understand, we have to learn to live with this virus. Uh, and, and we've let uh, uh, our lives be controlled for the last two years in a significant amount of fear. Um, uh, and now we're, we're gonna have to change some of that thinking. Um, we've, got, you know, we've got vaccines that are safe and effective. Uh, the third dose is pr proving to be acceptable exceptionally protective, 88 to 95% against severe outcomes. We now have oral antiviral outpatient therapies. Yes, it's 10,800 dose uh, treatments that are available to Ontarians in January, another 10,000 in February, but more will be available. And I do believe further uh, medications and other vaccines may be available to us, uh, like Novavax in the near, uh, uh, in the near term. Uh, so the, 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 um, the, epidemic, the pandemic is evolving. We're getting new interventions. Uh, we may get even newer vaccines that some uh, of those that were hesitant may want uh, to review. Uh, but we have to have a balanced and proportionate response um, uh, to, to this uh, virus. And we have to look at the mental, the physical, the social, the economic, and the educational impacts that this virus has had on, on our children and our uh, businesses. Uh, and um, learn from the last two years that sometimes we were too cautious. Uh, it, it'll never be exactly right for everybody, and uh, it's healthy to have debate, but we do have to have a balanced uh, response to this virus uh, and, and learn to live with it. Last question. Your last question comes from Colin DeMello with CTV News. Please go ahead. 
Hey, Dr. Moore, um, just talking about the data that you were mentioning, um, you, you've always been a very data-driven uh, person, but um, over the last number of weeks and months, I mean, you've really started to pare back uh, the PCR testing, rapid testing, COVID information in schools. Um, now you're removing contact tracing requirements. So all of those tools over the past two years were designed to tell us, you know, if there was smoke, there could be fire. How are you going to know now if things are getting worse? If, if things are getting worse, we still have a significant amount of PCR testing that's done uh, across Ontario. So uh, you know, 40,000 tests um, or more uh, on a daily basis. And the percentage of them being positive um, was uh, averaging for seven days, 18%. But today it's 14%. That's trending in the right direction. So we still have that as a, an important surveillance signal. We still have testing for anyone hospitalized in Ontario. And that number uh, it today is trending in the right direction, down 371 uh, cases admitted to hospital. The ICU numbers are stable. The number of uh, individuals requiring ventilation, uh, sadly, it's going up a, a little, uh, but not accelerating rapidly. So all of those metrics are still very good. And then we put that in the face of 2 million additional Ontarians uh, got vaccinated since January 5th and the additional protection that we have against, uh, against this virus through improved vaccination coverage at a population level. More and more of our children are getting protected uh, with their first and now their second doses, five to 11 years of age. And now for those that are unvaccinated or immunocompromised uh, and get COVID-19, we have uh, outpatient oral uh, uh, antiviral therapy. So uh, to, to me, this is giving, giving us greater confidence um, uh, and Ontarians have stayed uh, relatively united in adhering to all the best practices, masking in public, uh, on buses, on subways, on protecting each other um, through the basic public health measures, as well as uh, I think 90% of, uh, uh, of the uh, 12 and up population being vaccinated, I, I think is, is brilliant. Um, uh, together, all of those metrics um, uh, inform us on a daily basis uh, of where we're heading. And I do believe we're cresting uh, and are, are, have reached a peak. So the sacrifices Ontarians have made uh, is working and that we can now start uh, uh, on the 31st to safely reopen in a balanced, proportionate, safe and cautious means. Okay, thank you. And it sounds like from everything you're saying today, uh, you know, the endemic really is, is on the horizon here. So can you give me what you think uh, you want to see before saying, you know, we can lift uh, the masking requirement, we can lift all of the uh, physical distancing requirements? Do you think that that might come before May, as an example? I'm very, very hopeful, uh, Colin, uh, and thanks for that question. So uh, as we said, we thought January would be tough, and it certainly has been. Uh, and my condolences to anyone that's lost a loved one. Um, February, I do hope we've, we're cresting and we'll start to decelerate on the health system impact. I do think March will be a much better month, and certainly by April, um, we'll be heading to that low rate of uh, activity in the community. Uh, it always helps to, you know, to understand that the weather's going to get better. We will get outdoors more. There will be more sunshine every day. Uh, I do. I hope you're hearing hope in my voice. Uh, and as we head to that low endemic rate. That's when we review all public health measures that have been put in play. Uh, no one wants them a minute longer than they have to be, and they have to be proportionate to the risk. I do see the risk going down less and less day by day, month by month going forward, all the while staying humble in front of this virus, uh, deep humility that I can make these statements, uh, understanding that we have to monitor for any new variant, uh, any change in the protection from the vaccine. Uh, and, and I wanna assure Ontarians, we've got a great laboratory system uh, and network monitoring for any new variant in Ontario, good whole genome sequencing uh, and good partnership at a national level with the National Medical Lab and with the WHO to continue to monitor for any other variants that arise. Uh, that we may need to change our strategy on. But so far, um, uh, uh, I am hopeful uh, and anticipating March and April uh, uh, having uh, much lower risk for all Ontarians. Thanks, everyone.